And I am going to speak from a passage and some similar things. Uh, I spoke from this, I think, eight years ago. So I know you don't remember at all, <laughs> eight, eight or nine years ago. But as, I was, uh, as I've been preparing, the Lord put this on my heart. So I want us to come back to a passage, and it's in Acts chapter 3. And um, we're going to look at some of the things. Some of you, if you have a really, really great memory, there's some of this that you will you'll say, oh yeah, I think I remember that. But the Lord has, has laid on my heart some other, um, some other aspects as well. And I'd like us to turn this morning to Acts chapter 3. And I'd like us to look at the healing, the miraculous healing of the lame beggar at the gate, at the gate that's named Beautiful. This is in Acts chapter 3. Does anybody remember that one? Yes. <laughs> Your memory is great. But the Lord does have something new for us this morning, and uh, I want us to, to look there. And I'd like us just to read it together. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and I'm just going to read verses 1 through 10 uh, first, and then we will go back through it and we'll look at a few other things as well. Peter and John, are we reading New Living Translation? Okay, here we go. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us, the lame man, it was not an amen, it was a man, the lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. And then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. And then, walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. Amen. This story that is so familiar to us, we come again this morning and we ask the Holy Spirit to Give us new eyes to see and understanding for this story. Lord, we come to your word this morning. And Lord, we know that you have given us the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. Lord, help us to understand truth this morning. The Holy Spirit who gives us life, give us life this morning. The Holy Spirit who guides us. Oh, Holy Spirit, guide us this morning. The Holy Spirit who gives direction ahead. Lord, give us direction ahead as we look at this passage again this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. A very familiar story to us. And I want us to look at it uh, in the light of the familiarity. And for some of you that, you that don't remember it so well, we'll go over some of the things that we've looked at before. But I want us to look at some other things as well. And we see Peter and John. I, Peter and John are an interesting combination to me. Let's put back up verses 1 through 5. And we'll just keep that up as we're, as we're talking this morning. So we'll have that up. The Lord puts together people, uh, very unusual combinations, I find. And I love, love it when the Lord does it. Because when we look at this, we know quite a lot about Peter and we know quite a lot about John, don't we? They are quite different as far as we know. Uh, we don't know Peter's age, he, but he is likely one of the older ones of the disciples. Those of you that are going to join us this afternoon, you're going to, we're going to be studying uh, Peter together this afternoon. He's the first disciple we're going to look at in our afternoon Bible study, but we know quite a lot about him. You know, I've always, I've talked a lot about him and I've preached a lot from Peter. Um, and we're, we look at this, but he's likely one of the older ones. Peter was definitely uh, a spokesman in a way. He always had something to say. And this afternoon, as we're studying together, if you've been studying this week especially, we'll also look at how God took somebody like Peter and transformed him. And one of the ways I think the Lord transforms us is by bringing us 
into fellowship with other believers. I really do. And God brings us together with people who are not like us. If we are with people just like us all the time, I think there's not always a lot of growth. That's one of the reasons I really love Lighthouse. Uh, we are such a blend of different backgrounds and different char characters and different countries and different educational levels and different economic levels, all of that, that rich variety that God has brought together. And when God brings us together and unites us in Jesus because He has forgiven each one of us and because we have been redeemed, as we sang this morning as we began, redeemed, each one of us has something in common when we've been rede redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he brings us into His family and He starts fitting us together. Uh, we read about that in other parts of the Bible where uh, we're being fit together into a holy temple for the Lord. But we, He, he brings us together and we look at people around us and we are quite quite different if you were to you all know you know pastor pastor Renee and I work together and if you were to ask us we would tell you honestly especially as we first began to work together pastor Renee and I are very different in many ways and I think both of us would say there's been growth hasn't there pastor Renee Yes, yes. And you say, oh, you mean you had fights? No, I don't mean that way. But what I, <coughs> but what I do mean is God brings people who are very, very different together to work together and to fit together for His purposes. And if we resist that and we don't want to be and we don't want to let the Lord fit us together, we miss a lot of what God wants to do through us and what God wants to do in us as well. When I read about Peter and when I read about John, I believe from what we can see in the Bible, these two disciples were very, very different in character and in temperament. Peter, loud, always had something to say. I suspect although John was called one of the son sons of thunder, um, I suspect that John was a very gentle-hearted young man. As far as we can tell, he was one of the youngest disciples. And he was the, the apostle of love. And he had a very, from what we can see, a very gentle nature and very, very close to the Lord. And yet here's Peter, also very, very close to the Lord. And God brings them together in partnership. And we often see Peter and John together throughout the early parts of the New Testament and God brings them together for His purposes. So, this is, And this is just an aside. This is not even the main flow of this story. But I, I do, I encourage you in Lighthouse, don't just, I want to be with people like me. But let the Lord open your heart to be with other people. Open your heart to be with those who are different from you. You know, we've talked about this before, but for those of you who are newer to Lighthouse, from the very beginning, Lighthouse has chosen to be a church where everybody is welcome, no matter what their background is, no matter what language they speak. We, could, we have chosen not to have separate services uh, for, for different ethnic groups. We have chosen to meet together because we believe that's what God has for us. And that's God's plan and God's pattern for us. And God can do wonderful things when His people are willing to gather together in His name. So here we see Peter and John on the way to the temple. Two young men, both, both still young at that time, who really are quite different. I want us to see a few other things this morning. It was one afternoon and so there, as far as we know, there's nothing special going on. And they went to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. What? They went to, there's a prayer meeting at the temple? Yes, there's a prayer meeting at the temple. And here's another lesson for us this morning as we look at this story. Look at Peter and John. Now we know if we read Acts and we go to chapters 1 and 2, we already know that the Christians, the disciples, had already had a huge prayer meeting earlier as they waited on the Lord and the Holy Spirit was poured out. But I want us to see something else this morning. Peter and John are not going to a prayer meeting of Christians. 
when we look at this passage. They are on their way to the temple. They're going with all of their other Jewish brethren as part of the Jewish religion and they were they would go to the temple at about three o'clock in the afternoon for them that's considered going that's the afternoon prayer and that's going towards the end of the day from from three to six was the end of the day for them and they're on their way to the prayer service the prayer that would be uh, prayers that would be offered for the nation of Israel not only that do you know what would happen at three o'clock in the afternoon at the temple there would be an animal sacrifice still at that time because that was the Jewish religion that was what was ordained in the law and here are Peter and John on their way to the temple to take part in that what does that say to us I don't know all of the details and all of the background but one thing it does say to me is this we look at Peter and John they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit already they've been walking with Jesus for three and a half years they have revelation from the Lord they have seen the risen Jesus and yet they're still going along they have their prayer but they're still going to the temple for the sacrifice and one of the things I see here is that they still have growing and understanding to do there are still things they don't know there are still things they don't understand. There are still areas where they need to grow up in the Lord. And I think you and I are the same way. A lot of times when we've been Christians for a while, we've been going to church for a while, we start feeling like, I really, I understand it all. I know exactly what the Bible says. I know about this and I know about that. And if that's how we look at our Christian lives, we're going to get stuck in a rut. God still has more to show you. God still has more to show me. Do you know a couple of weeks ago I was driving to church and uh, I was praying as I was driving and I often pray when I'm driving. I pray not just Lord protect me from the traffic because the traffic's awful sometimes but I really do. That's For me that's a time I really pray. There's nobody else around. The windows are up. I can just be praying at the top of my voice and the person driving by me probably thinks oh she's talking on her Bluetooth or something like that <laughs> and I have something much better than Bluetooth because I'm communicating with heaven and um, but I I was I was just praying 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 I even do that sometimes on the MTR if I put my earphones if I'll put my uh, my ear, earbuds in and I'll just be praying away quietly because there are people around me and they would think I was really strange if they heard me praying out loud especially if I was praying in the spirit in other tongues but I'll just be praying quietly and they probably think oh she's singing she must be listening to music and she's singing um, but I really as I was driving down the highway I really I was praying Lord enlarge my capacity Lord increase my understanding Lord there's more of you and that's what we should all be praying I want you to know right now your pastors don't know everything your pastors don't have it all figured out we don't have it all together yet there's more that we need to know there's more that we need to learn and our capacity needs to be increased and we see it here with the disciples they're on their way to the temple they don't need to go to the temple for prayer anymore they don't need an animal sacrifice anymore but there's still understanding for them as well as they make their way to the temple they're going where to the temple gate the one that was called the beautiful gate at this time in the New Testament as we read or in the in Jewish in Jewish history by this time there were ten gates to the temples okay so you think what why would ten gates be needed each gate was for something specific um, this gate was used for this this gate was used for that and this gate that they were going to go into was called the beautiful gate why was it called the beautiful gate the Bible doesn't tell us but history does and it was called the beautiful gate because it was decorated much more beautifully than any of the other gates it was the gate that was closest to the sanctuary and probably that's why it was decorated more beautifully and it was called the beautiful gate and I want you to get the picture as we think about it because this was something that really happened here is this beautiful beautiful gate a scene of great great beauty and as far as we know from reading about history it's called Herod's temple Herod's temple was a beautiful temple it was gorgeous there was an overlay of gold when the Sun was shining on it it would shine throughout the city it was beautiful and yet in the very shadow of that 
there were beggars, there were the lame, there were the poor, there were the blind, and all these people in varying conditions of life that were not beautiful at all, but were ugly and broken and dirty and hopeless. And there was that beautiful gate and all these people on the way to afternoon prayer. The action's very straightforward. Peter and John approach the temple. And I've shared with some of you before, uh, I've been to Tibet before, and there's so many, so many temples throughout Tibet. And this may be true in other areas as well. I, I haven't been to any temples in Hong Kong, so I don't know. But it's very true in Tibet. Um, all of these, these Buddhist temples, Tibetan Buddhist temples, which are terrible, terrible, awful places with an awful feeling around them even. And uh, you just, you feel, you don't know why anybody would ever even want to go to such places because it's so heavy and dark and evil, really, really, really evil. You see all, I'd see all these temples and outside the temples in Tibet, there would be so many beggars outside the temple waiting for something and many people would give because in Tibetan Buddhism, it's good to give alms to the poor and so many beggars would be outside the temple. And the Jews believed the same thing. And so outside the gates of the temple, especially outside the beautiful gate, because many, many people would go through that gate, there would be many beggars. There would be many people. There would, be, there would have been other beggars that were lame. There would have been many that were poor or blind or some other, some other disability. And they would be gathered outside the gates as well. And it would be, there would be people with great, great need, just as there are people with great need today as well. And here come Peter and John, and we've talked about this before, those of you that remember, but I want you to think about Peter and John and what's going on. They're on their way to evening prayers. It would have been a very busy time. It would have been noisy. It would have been dusty because the roads were not paved. Their feet would have been dirty. There would have been people jostling and shoving. There probably would have been money changers outside the gates of the temple still. There probably would have been people bringing animals to the temple and the animals probably didn't want to go to the temple and they would have been making noise as they were all going, really? That would have been, that would have been the scene. And think about this as we think about that scene. We don't know the exa exact timing, but it is likely that it was only a few months earlier that Jesus had been crucified, that Jesus had been raised from the dead, that the Holy Spirit had been poured out, that Jesus had gone back to heaven and that the Holy Spirit had been poured out on Peter and John and those early disciples and many others. And yet, here are all of these people still going to a religion that could not help them, that could not save them, that could not meet their needs, that could not cleanse their sin. Jesus had come, and yet for them, their lives were still the same. I'm sure if you'd asked any one of them, they would have said, oh yeah, 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 I remember that Jesus. Yeah, I heard about him. I, I even heard him speak one time. And yet their lives were no different. And we live in a world like that today as well, where Jesus has come, Jesus has risen, and there's the offer of hope, and there's the offer of life, and yet and they may even have gone to churches before. They may even have gone to, they may even have gone to a rally before, a crusade before, and yet their lives are no different. They're still the same. And Peter and John walk along just as you and I walk along in the same sort of world. And then there's the beggar. And we don't know much about him, as I said before. When we read later, we find out he's at least 40 years old. We know that he was born lame so that he's never walked, which, by the way, makes this miracle greater, as we're going to see a little bit later, because as we're going to see, he's never walked. Those of you that are parents, how long did it take your child to walk? You see, there are all sorts of wonderful, delightful miracles in the midst of this one big miracle. How long? 
my parents were worried about me. I was a late bloomer. I think I started walking very, very late. I was well over a year. How about some of you? When did your children, Hazel? When did nine months? Both of them? No, just Stephanie. Of course it was Stephanie. <laughs> How about Alexander? Eleven. Eleven. So two months later. Okay. Took them a while. And they fell down plenty of times, didn't they? They sure did. They fell down. They'd get back up. They'd crawl a little bit. How about some of the rest of you? How about Toby? Ten months. Right in the middle. How about your kids? Eileen? When? Fifteen. Wow. You were a little bit worried, huh? <laughs> I think I was something like 15 months. How about Joshua and David? Do you remember? Eight months, three weeks. That would be Joshua? Of course it was Joshua. <laughs> of course it was Joshua. Ten months, two weeks. Ten months, two She's still... Parents always remember these details, don't they? Some parents, too. <laughs> See, you noticed... <laughs> What Stephen meant by that was, I don't remember, but Panina does. <laughs> and, you know, as we look at this, to me, that's one of the wonderful parts about this miracle. And I'm talking about the whole story because we already know that, the, that this lame man is, is healed. But look at it. When Peter and John, through the power of the Holy Spirit, heal this man, it's the power of Jesus, they pick him up, they grab him, and he immediately starts walking. I love that, don't you? It's a great... We miss delightful parts of the Bible at times because we're so used to kind of reading through. He didn't have to learn how to walk. In fact, he didn't even have to learn how to run and he didn't have to learn how to jump. He did it all. There we go. And the man, he was instantly healed and he was instantly strengthened. When God does something, he does it well. When God does something, he does it right. And so we see this picture here. Now, back to the story. I just jumped ahead a little bit, but let's go back to the story again. And I want you to, to think with me about it as they pass by and as they see him. Um, as we look at this, it says that one day Peter and John were on their way to the temple. So they weren't doing anything special that day. They were just doing what they would normally do. And they were on their way to a prayer meeting. And I want you to think with me for just a minute about prayer meetings as we look at the early church. Because we have some wonderful examples in the, in the New Testament about prayer meetings. That first prayer meeting when they waited on the Lord and then the Holy Spirit was poured out. And how many were saved? 3,000 plus were saved. And then you go a little bit further and they pray again. And as they pray, the church is gathered and they pray. The whole room is shaken and they preach the word with, word with boldness. You go forward a little bit more. Peter's imprisoned and he's sleeping and he's going to trial the next day. And the likely outcome of that trial would be the death of Peter. That was the most likely, likely outcome of the trial. And Peter's asleep, but the church is praying and he is released from prison miraculously by an angel and these are wonderful things that we see but brothers and sisters there are not just special times of prayer when God does something special in our lives as there was in the early church there is to be a heart and a foundation of prayer all the time and when there is we are positioned and we're in a place where God can do something special. If the only time you and I pray is when we've got a special request, you know, let's have a special prayer meeting because we're going to do something. Uh, let's have a special prayer meeting because I have a special need. God still meets that and God is pleased. But when we look at the pattern of the New Testament, what we see is a whole lifestyle, a whole, a whole a atmosphere of prayer all the time. Peter and John are on their way to the temple to pray. It's not a special prayer meeting. It's just what they do. It's part of their lives. And out of that, God is ready to do a mighty miracle. 
And I know some people would look at this and they would say, yes, but Pastor Jennifer, you don't understand. God was going to do this anyhow. It was his special plan for that day. And I agree. I believe that. That was something special that God was going to do. But brothers and sisters, I believe if you and I are going to see God do special things, if we are going to be part of the special things that God wants to do and has planned to do, you and I have to be in position for those things through prayer. Through prayer. Prayer positions us for the work of God. Prayer positions us for the moving of God. Do you wonder why sometimes good things happen to other people a lot? Or, wow, they had a chance to share. Their, things are always happening to them. Wow, God's always doing wonderful things. Do you know why? I think it's because people are praying. Those people are praying. We sometimes hear from our sisters in the Philippines, from Amor, or from Rena, or some of these others, these <laughs> wonderful things that are happening. Do you know why I believe it's happening? It's not just, oh, it's because they're there. It's because they're waiting on the Lord and there's an atmosphere of prayer. And Peter and John, as they walk to the temple that day, have hearts full and lives full of the Holy Spirit and full of prayer because the Bible tells us the early church, the New Testament church, it was a church of prayer. And so they walk along and as they walk along, they see the beggar. Now, which, per which side sees which side first? The Bible tells us what? Okay, he saw Peter and John about to enter and he asked them for some money. So he asks first, but he's not paying any attention. Okay, let's see what comes next. Then Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. And I want us to pause on that just a minute. Peter and John would have passed by this beggar many, many times before, but this day was different. This day was different. God had something special in mind. God had something special planned for this beggar this day. Why? because it was God's timing. It was God's timing, but I believe there was more than that going on as well. Peter and John were full of the Holy Spirit. Peter and John were full of God. Peter and John were full of the love and the life of Jesus because when the Holy Spirit comes in, when the Holy Spirit is given His place in our lives, do you know what He will do? He will do exactly what Jesus said He would do when He came. Jesus said, when He comes, He will tell you about me. When He comes, He will do this. He will lead you. He will guide you. He said, when He comes, then in the filling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will go, wait for the power, and then you will go. And when we see Peter and John at this point, they are people, they are men who have the heart of Jesus. And what is the heart of Jesus? The heart of Jesus is a heart of love. What is the heart of Jesus? The heart of Jesus is a heart that cares for those that don't yet have life and that need help. The heart of Jesus sees the beggar. The heart of Jesus sees those that everybody else passes by. That's the heart of Jesus. And when we give the Holy Spirit His place in our lives, when we let Him control our hearts and fill our lives as He desires to, do you know what He's going to do? He's going to give us the heart of Jesus. He's going to give us the heart of Jesus. And the heart of Jesus led Jesus to go to Samaria to one woman. The heart of Jesus led Him to preach to multitudes. The heart of Jesus led Him where there were people who had needs. And if you and I have the heart of Jesus. We're going to be doing the same thing. We're going to be going to the same places. We're going to see beggars that we haven't seen before. And I think Peter and John saw the beggar that day because they were full of the Holy Spirit. They were full of the Holy Spirit. And then Peter said, look at us. And the lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you. Now, let me stop there just a minute as we look at that. In fact, Peter and John, as the disciples did, Peter and John received a lot of silver and gold. You said, what? 
They said they're poor. If we look at the rest of the story, if you move ahead just a little bit in the next, in the next chapter, you will see that the Holy Spirit was working in people's hearts, and so their hearts were generous. Do you know what happens when the Holy Spirit has control of your life and your heart? You know what's going to happen? He's going to have control of your pocketbook as well. He is. He is. And when the Holy Spirit has control of our lives, one of the things He will do in your life and my life is He will make us generous. He'll make us generous. Stingy has nothing to do with God at all. It's not the heart of Jesus. Stingy, tight, mean, whatever. It has nothing to do with the heart of, heart of God at all. And when we find ourselves holding on that's when we say, oh God, holding on to the things that we have and being unwilling to share. That's when we pray, God, I need more of you. I need more of you. Let me tell you something personal. You know that the end of July, Sister Betty went back to the U.S. and I moved from a three-story village house to a one-floor apartment um, That is, that was so much smaller. Now some of you would say, oh, it's still bigger than what I have to live in, and that's true. And that's true, but we had to downsize. So we had all three stories. We had the roof, we had the garden, and everything else, and we had to downsize. And Sister Betty sent a bunch of boxes back to the States, but I looked at all the stuff that was still left, and I had all of mine, all of my stuff, and then a lot of the stuff that we shared, and then a the lot, lot of the things that she left, and I knew it wouldn't fit. I knew it wouldn't fit as Gigi would tell you, because she was there when we were moving the boxes. And, and I looked at all the stuff, and I have to tell you what I did. I, let me tell you my heart first. It was very hard for me, because all of those things were things that I had bought. I had spent money to buy these things. I had spent money to buy these clothes. I had spent money to buy these pots and these pans and these things for the table and, and all of these various things. And I looked at these things and I looked at the space and I thought, it's not going to fit. <laughs> How many of you have ever, have you ever had that before? I would so much rather upsize than downsize, <laughs> but I had to downsize. And do you know what I had to do? to be able to let go of those things. You know, we had this great and glorious yard sale a, a couple of months ago, and that was from all the stuff that came out from the house. I could have put it in boxes, and I could have tried to make it fit, but this is what I did, and it wasn't easy. I did not want to let go of those things. I didn't. That's human nature. They were, they were mine. They were mine. <laughs> really, it's mine and I didn't want to let go. And as we started sorting, and as I started sorting, do you know what I had to start doing? I'm being very honest with you. You're gonna say, pastors like that? Yes, pastors like that. Pastors are human. <laughs> pastors are human. And if Pastor Renee and I shared with you some of the prayers that we have to pray sometimes for ourselves, then you would really say, wow, pastors really are human, and we really are. We really are. I had to pray, God, All of this stuff, I was able to buy it with the money that is yours because God, my money is God's money. I said, God, that's your money that I bought those things with, and so these things are yours. So Lord, help me to let it go. It's yours. You gave it to me, so God, I can help me to let it go. And the Lord helped me to let it go. And it wasn't easy at all. It really wasn't easy. And you know what I'd have to do? Two or three days later, I'd have to pray again. <laughs> I did. I would pray, Lord. And then I'd have to pray again, Lord, let it go. And the Lord would help my heart and I would just start, I would just start pulling out clothes and pulling out clothes and pulling out purses and pulling out shoes. And the Lord had to help my, and Pastor Renee's laughing at me. That's okay. Pastor Renee, if somebody, if you had to give up some of your toys, <laughs> Austin's in the back pointing at the computer right now. <laughs> this, I, you see, <laughs> you'd have to pray too. <laughs> 
Anytime we start holding on really tightly and saying, it's mine, it's mine, that's the time really, all joking aside, and we have, we have laughed about it, but all joking aside, that's the time to pray and say, Lord, it's yours. Help me to let it go. Help me to let it go. And some of the things that we let go, God was able to use to bless. And I'm not saying that to say, oh, Jennifer, praise you, praise you. No, I'm, I'm telling you this to let you know I'm human too. And we hold on to these things. But that's not the heart of God. And Peter and John look at, at the, le, the, the lame beggar and they say to him, we don't have silver and gold. And I love that picture because you know what? Peter and John were in the midst of a great revival where they could have had all the silver and gold they wanted because people were coming to the church and to the apostles and the Bible tells us they were bringing their gifts and laying them at the feet of the apostles and that would have been in coins and gold and silver and the P Peter and John and the disciples had great opportunity to take whatever they needed for themselves but they didn't because they had the heart of God and they look at the lame beggar and they say we don't have silver and gold but what we do have we give you stand up and walk and what they had was so much more than silver or gold I want to challenge you this morning as we come to a close they told him we don't have silver and gold do you know what silver and gold is the easiest thing we can do when we want to meet people's needs isn't it here's a little money here's a little something but the needs that are far greater rise up and walk rise up and walk only Jesus can meet those needs only Jesus can meet those needs but Peter and John had enough of Jesus and enough faith to say to the beggar rise up and walk now some of us this morning as we look at this we would say pastor Jennifer <laughs> I do not have enough faith to go to a beggar and say rise up and walk and let's be honest we see beggars in the MTR don't we we see beggars sometimes out on Nathan Road. Do you think Jesus is saying, this, the example here for you and for me, is that we are supposed to go to the beggars and say, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. <laughs> I, do you think that's what this story is teaching? I don't think it is. I don't think is it, it is at all. But what I do think it's telling us is, we do have Jesus. And we have Jesus, enough of Jesus, to meet the needs of the world around us, of the beggars around us. And if we don't have enough, then we need to go to Jesus for more. And you say, Pastor Jennifer, I don't have enough faith to tell a beggar to stand up and walk. Guess what? I don't either. <laughs> but that's because Jesus hasn't given it to me. But if Jesus does, then we say, rise up and walk. And I want to challenge you and encourage you this morning as we come to a close. You and I should have enough of Jesus that we can say to the beggars around us, not just the beggars that kneel on Nathan Road and have a tin cup in front of them, but the people around us who cannot help themselves. That's what a beggar is, someone who can't help himself. And you and I are surrounded by people who cannot help themselves. But we must have enough of Jesus to say, I don't have silver or gold, but I have Jesus. And I give you Jesus. I give you Jesus. But brothers and sisters, it's going to take in your life and my life more prayer. It's going to take more of Jesus in our lives. It's going to take more of the Holy Spirit in our lives to meet the needs of the beggars that we see. And as I say this to you, I say this to myself as well. Because as I was preparing and as I was reading and as I was studying, I thought, Lord, I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have done that. But I want more of Jesus in my life. Don't you? I do. I want more of Jesus in my life. I want more prayer in my life so that as I walk back and forth doing the things that I do, I will have the eyes of Jesus. You will have the eyes of Jesus to see 
the beggars around us that cannot help themselves and will not be helped unless we help, unless we help, and unless we have enough of Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's close in prayer. Hallelujah. Lord, we read about Peter and John and this lame beggar this morning, and God, if we were honest, we would say, this is light years away from us. Lord, we read this story and to us it feels like it's something that they could do and we could never do that. But God, I pray you would help us this morning to see what you want us to see in this. Lord, that there are things for us in this event. Oh God, oh God, help us not to be like everybody else that just goes back and forth to the temple doing their thing, being religious, joining in a prayer meeting, coming home again, and missing the people with needs, missing the beggars that need help. Father, I pray that you would give us hearts for you. Lord, I pray that you would give us hunger for you. Lord, I pray that you would bring us to the place, work with our hearts, Lord, that we would come to you, that we would have enough of you, that we would want more of you, so that we would have hearts to reach, eyes to see, and a will to touch beggars and to give them you, to give them what they need, to give them what will change their lives just as you have changed our lives. God, don't let us stay the way that we are. Lord, help us not to have stingy hearts when it comes to you and to your blessings, but Lord, help us to be open-hearted and help us to be open-handed with the many blessings that you have poured in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> God bless.